In 2014, Spanish model Adriana Abenia appeared on Pasa Palabra, Spain's version of Password. During a segment where she had to listen to a series of song clips and identify the name and performer, the host and other contestants noticed that she kept looking at a phone she had hidden between her legs. It turns out, Abinia had been using the music identification app Shazam to, well, identify the music. She was called out on it right on the show, but everyone seemed to just laugh it off. In a radio show interview a few days after the episode, she said, I want people to understand that television is a show. I have already been to Pasa Palabra many times, and I want to enjoy myself, but above all for people to enjoy. Nobody told me that cheating could not be done. And in life, you shouldn't take anything for granted. You have to understand that it was to help another person. I'm very altruistic. Moment of Truth was a game show in which contestants answered extremely personal questions while hooked up to a polygraph, then wagered against their results live in front of family and friends. One deceptive response, no matter how many painfully true revelations before it, meant zero cash. I want to warn you that what you're about to see is very difficult to watch. Lauren and Frank Cleary basically colluded to make it look like they were revealing huge and terrible secrets about their marriage. The biggest bombshells were that Lauren wished she'd married her ex-boyfriend instead of Frank, and that she'd been unfaithful to him. Except the couple admitted that none of this stuff was actually secret. They talked about all of the questions beforehand, with Lauren revealing that she never physically cheated on Frank, despite answering yes to whether she'd had sexual relations with someone other than him. It was all for nothing, though, as they didn't win any cash because the lie detector caught a particularly ironic lie. Lauren answering yes to the question of whether she thought she was a good person or not. Our Little Genius was supposed to be a show about genius children answering trivia questions for cash. However, despite promos running on Fox, the show never actually aired after a contestant's parents filed a complaint with the FCC, claiming that the production staff was feeding answers to the kids. On January 7, 2010, just six days before the show was set to premiere, show creator Mark Burnett issued a statement that read in part, I recently discovered that there was an issue with how some information was relayed to contestants during the pre-production of Our Little Genius. As a result, I am not comfortable delivering the episodes without reshooting them. I believe my series must always be beyond reproach, so I have requested that Fox not air these episodes. They never did, and the show was never revived. One of the most notorious contestants in the history of The Biggest Loser was Neil Tezwani, who became infamous during the fourth season when he intentionally gained 17 pounds of water weight just before a weigh-in, with the goal of sabotaging another player. It worked getting competitor Jez eliminated, but it eventually came back around to Tezwani in his long-awaited elimination in the final week of competition. Tezwani told People magazine that he was just trying to keep some of his friends around longer, but fans weren't buying it. And the trainers weren't particularly impressed with the maneuver either, with Jillian Michaels describing it as, quote, disgusting. And Bob Harper? I am so mad that I cannot even see straight right now. In 2011, the New York City-based food truck Corilla Barbecue was eliminated from the great food truck race for allegedly adding money to their till to make it look like they had sold more than the competitors. Instead, they got kicked off the show. The owners of the Korean-Mexican fusion truck maintained their innocence, despite an apparent confidentiality agreement that barred them from speaking out in too much detail. It wasn't until 2016 that Corilla Barbecue owner Eddie Song finally tried to explain what happened, claiming that they had simply teamed up with the barbecue joint in order to get around a restriction against selling meat during a challenge. And the show's claim that they added their own money to the till was not true. This is the worst possible outcome ever. In the 1950s, the government began investigating cheating on game shows after a scandal on the hit series, 21. Dotto was another show that eventually got wrapped up in the broader game show scandal. Part quiz show, part children's game, Dotto challenged contestants to answer questions to win a chance to play Connect the Dots. As the picture slowly filled in, contestants were supposed to guess the famous person they were drawing. The show was hosted by Jack Nars, and when the cheating story broke, no one was more surprised than him. As he explained years later to PBS, Nars was going about his life when he suddenly got a phone call letting him know that the show was canceled and he wouldn't need to head to work on Monday. Apparently, one of the show's contestants became nosy while waiting for his chance to step onto the stage. 
he dug through the purse of another contestant and found all the answers to the upcoming questions. Nars was grilled about the cheating and even had to undergo a polygraph to clear his name. Ultimately, the producers behind Dotto were the ones who had rigged the game. The shocking reveal strengthened Congress's case against game shows of the era. The $64,000 question was another 50s game show caught up in corruption. The show had contestants answering trivia questions, and it made a point of finding contestants who had deep knowledge in an unexpected area, like a young woman and working psychologist with an encyclopedic knowledge of boxing history. At least, that's what it looked like. In reality, contestants were often chosen solely for their outward appearance and then fed the answers backstage. During the taping of one episode, a young poet from Greenwich Village started to put the pieces together. He finished out the episode with a $4,000 prize, but he was so disgusted by the cheating that he never came to collect. Dr. Joyce Brothers was brought on to be a surprising boxing expert, but she did her job too well because she unexpectedly studied up on the subject and became an actual expert. The producers got sick of her and started to make the questions ridiculously difficult, but Dr. Brothers still nailed all the answers. She was later brought in to testify about the show's legitimacy, and though the $64,000 question was a total scam, Dr. Brothers' performance on it had been legitimate. Project Runway is a series that pits burgeoning fashion designers against each other in a fierce, season-long competition. The show started in 2004, and by season three, it had its first cheater. Keith Michael was a contestant on Project Runway in 2006. His tenure on the show didn't last all that long, though. One of Michael's fellow contestants found pattern books in his room, which was against the rules. The same week those were discovered, Michael took off from the set without asking and didn't come back for several hours. Project Runway gave him the boot and carried on with the rest of the season. What seems like a cut-and-dry case of cheating may not be so simple. Years later, in an interview with People magazine, Michael still insisted that he'd never cheated. He claimed that the pattern books were part of his day job designing menswear and had nothing to do with the show, and he only left the set to check his email at his boyfriend's apartment. He said, I think this whole thing is far-fetched and crazy. The kind of sad part is that I never use those books to give myself any unfair advantage. Maybe the secret ingredient when it comes to cheating is to simply not understand how the game works to begin with. There was once an accidental cheater on The Price is Right who seemed to be so confused by the entire show that he actually got away with completely breaking the rules. Host Bob Barker pulled a man named Breton onto the stage to play a quick round of flip-flop. The game takes an item with a four-digit price point and asks contestants to move some of the numbers around to match the real price. Instead, Breton got confused and just hit the button that revealed the winning answer. Barker walked off the stage while the audience howled with laughter. Breton, to his credit, just looked completely confused. Before he had a chance to explain himself, Barker said that he could take the prize anyway as long as he went away. There is only one solution to this almost insoluble problem. I'm going to give you the prize. Get off the stage. Project Runway may have had its first cheating scandal in 2006, but the show's troubles didn't end with Keith Michael. Years later, a woman named Claire Butendorp got kicked off Project Runway season 16 for breaking the rules. This time, the problem was that Butendorp had snuck a measuring tape into her room and was using it to measure clothes after hours. That was strictly against the rules. When Tim Gunn asked her about what had happened, Butendorp owned up to cheating. Is it true that you've been measuring garments in your room? I have measured a tank top and I have measured the crotch of a pair of pants. Thanks in part to her confession, Butendorp had to leave the show. A little while later, though, Butendorp changed her story. She came back for a special reunion episode, and on this Project Runway appearance, Butendorp claimed that the entire cheating scandal had been a misunderstanding. She said that she'd never used the measuring tape and had brought it back to her room by mistake. According to the designer, she got caught up in the heat of the moment, and when Gunn originally asked her about what had happened, she claimed she didn't realize what she was admitting to, because she misunderstood the question. I answered the question that I thought that I had heard. Either way, the damage had been done. Do you remember when Jeopardy became a spelling competition? If not, then you're not alone. Viewers were quick to call out Alex Trebek, the game's judges, and the show's producers. When a 12-year-old contestant lost the final Jeopardy on a meaningless technicality, Thomas Hurley was only in the eighth grade when he got a chance to become a competitor on the show 
and by the time Final Jeopardy rolled around, he earned over $2,000. Then, disaster struck. Hurley answered a prompt about an 1863 document signed by Abraham Lincoln with the question, what is Emancipation Proclamation? It was just a simple typo, but ultimately, the judges decided that the extra T Hurley included in his answer was enough to disqualify him. Fans of the show were outraged on Hurley's behalf, and he was also outraged, telling reporters that he felt he had been cheated. Ten years after Thomas Hurley's disappointing Jeopardy loss, another spelling-related scandal rocked the show. This time, the contestant who ran into trouble was Ben Chan, who had an incredible run. Chan's time as a Jeopardy star began in April 2023. His winning streak was briefly delayed by a bout with COVID, but in total, Chan won an astounding nine games. No one can stay on top forever. But the way that Chan was taken out of Jeopardy really stings. As in Hurley's game, Chan's loss came down to a misspelling. Chan answered a prompt about Shakespeare's characters for Much Ado About Nothing, with the response, who are Beatrice and Benedict? Unfortunately, the character Chan was looking for is named Benedict. Fans were once again outraged about a Jeopardy favorite being ousted on a technicality. Many pointed out the show's rules declare that spelling doesn't count in the game. Nevertheless, a later clause in the rules spelled trouble for Chan. Spelling doesn't matter in Jeopardy as long as the answer is phonetically correct. Here, the difference between a T and a K makes all the difference. As disappointing as his loss must have been, Chan still went home with more than a quarter of a million dollars in winnings. So that probably eased the sting a bit. Jeopardy! is far from the only game show that robbed its contestants. We've already seen how game show rigging was once the bedrock of the entire genre. Modern day shows might be more closely regulated, but even they managed to get away with giving a contestant the short end of the stick from time to time. One incident that occurred on Wheel of Fortune might be the most blatant example of a show cheating its own players since the 1950s. Though she didn't know it at the time, Renee Durrett stepped onto the Wheel of Fortune stage with a massive disadvantage. She had a light Southern accent that subtly affected the way she pronounced certain words. It shouldn't have mattered, but that accent cost Durrett the game. Durrett was slowly filling in the letters of a mystery phrase. She correctly guessed the letters S, N, E, M, and G. From there, she felt confident she knew the answer and guessed. Seven swans a-swimming. It should have been correct, but Durrett pronounced the last word in the phrase, swimmin', and the judges decided she was incorrect due to her accent. Durrett graciously accepted the loss, but fans of the show feel that she got ripped off. In 1988, Carrie D. Ketchum won over $58,000 on NBC's Super Password, making him the largest one-game winner in the history of the show. Instead of walking away with a prize check, though, Ketchum was taken into custody when he returned to the show's offices to collect his winnings. Not only did Ketchum use the alias Patrick Quinn on the show, the name of a former college professor, according to the Los Angeles Times, but he was also on the run from fraud charges in Alaska and Indiana. After his arrest, Ketchum pleaded guilty to two counts of mail fraud, out of what prosecutors described as a virtual tornado of deception. He was eventually sentenced to five years in prison, though no one ever accused him of unfairly gaming Super Password. It's unclear whether Ketchum was able to keep his prize money, but it seems highly unlikely. He could have told me he was Santa Claus at that point. I probably would have believed him. He was so smooth. He was really good. Wow Wow We was a popular variety show in the Philippines that often gave contestants the chance to win huge sums of money. Both the show and host Willie Pappy Ravillame landed in hot water when a segment went wrong on air and apparently revealed that the game was rigged. Ravillame was going through a standard routine, showing a contestant the money inside a handful of prize wheels they'd passed up. When he revealed the number on the final wheel, though, instead of the two it was supposed to show, meaning the two million peso grand prize the contestant had passed up, it actually showed a zero. Ravillame then pulled a two out of the money wheel as well, revealing to viewers that every wheel could potentially contain multiple numbers that could be swapped at a moment's notice, allowing Ravillame to decide on the fly who won and who lost. The Department of Trade and Industry took a serious interest in the case and opened an investigation into the show. Ravillame didn't own up to any wrongdoing. In the end, the department found that Wow Wow Wee had, at the very least, rigged that particular segment of the show. 
The network behind the series, ABS, CBN, faced a hefty fine, but Wow Wow Wee was allowed to continue airing. Claim to Fame is an ABC show that kicked off in 2022. Hosted by Kevin and Frankie Jonas, each season gathers a group of people with famous relatives and puts them together under one roof, sort of like Big Brother. While living in the house, contestants take on various challenges and also try to figure out who's related to whom. The entire show would fall apart if any contestants had time to Google their roommates, which is why phones are supposed to be handed in before the show begins. One contestant in the show's first season thought that he could get around the rules. He ended up being caught in the very first episode. Right at the end of the episode, contestants Pepper and Maxwell were supposed to guess who the other person's famous relative was. Before they had a chance, the show's producers called over the Jonas Brothers, who came back a moment later with the shocking news. Maxwell had snuck his phone into the house and had been caught on camera, using it under the covers in his bedroom. The Jonas Brothers revealed that Maxwell is Chuck Norris's grandson before asking him to leave the show for good. Some shows should have been recognized as a mistake from the start. Who Wants to Marry a Multimillionaire perfectly fits that bill and is arguably one of the worst reality shows ever. The premise is exactly what you're thinking. The show functioned like a beauty pageant, but the grand prize was an on-the-spot marriage to a man worth millions. The concept is practically begging for bad actors to come in and cause problems. As though trying to prove that point, the show fell on its face almost as soon as it started when the multimillionaire in question turned out to be a fraud. Rick Rockwell, a supposed real estate investor, married a nurse named Darva Conger in the first and only season of the show. Just days later, fans learned some shocking facts about Rockwell. He wasn't a real estate investor at all, but an actor with less than a million dollars in assets. Even worse, Rockwell had a 10-year-old restraining order against him from an ex-wife who claimed he'd abused her. Luckily, Conger was able to quickly have the marriage annulled. The show reached a similarly quick end, but its legacy lives on in other dating game shows. If you or someone you know is dealing with domestic abuse, you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. You can also find more information, resources, and support at their website.